politics is back, but it's not politics as usual. Brace, please, for the coming storm. So this week's column asks a very straightforward and perhaps silly sounding question. What is the point of August? Let me explain. Almost all the political year, I am paid to be part of the endless parliamentary treadmill of story after story after story. And it's fascinating. And there's always something to say. Somebody says something they shouldn't have said in front of a live microphone. Does anyone ever say, you know what, you've done a f- good job because everyone else has sat on their ass. There's a rumour of a reshuffle, or there is a reshuffle. Uh, an MP pinches another MP's bottom or somebody else's bottom, and on and on it goes. And a lot of the time, it can be a massive distraction machine, taking our attention away from the stuff that really matters. And as I have been floating on my back in the Atlantic off the coast of Scotland, it's given me a chance to think about perspective and the big challenges ahead. And I don't want this to be a long stream of gloom, I promise. Nonetheless, there are some things that I think do need to be said. Although the official statistics have revised upwards how the British economy did in the last couple of years, we have done much better than we thought. Nevertheless, the last two decades have given us such low growth and such low productivity growth that we are simply sitting on top of an economy which is too small to give the British people the kind of services and lives that they have come to expect. That is the fundamental problem. And that means that things like the the RAAC concrete crisis in schools is a good example of what goes wrong again and again and again. Because when governments don't have uh, the money to invest for the long term, Uh, and they have to take it away from day-to-day spending, then the pressure from the headlines and the press and the media and voters for more pay for this, this group of people or more money for this particular glaring injustice or whatever it is means there's a huge temptation to put off what needs to be done. And as schools right across England close this week for repairs, we see the consequence of that. Now, looking ahead... This is really, really tough for Labour. Assuming Labour form the next government, they have made a huge uh, emphasis on the need for investment and growth, and absolutely rightly. But in today's world, that will be very, very hard to achieve, that turnaround from low productivity, low growth, to the kind of economy that Labour say they want and will give us. And the reason for that is partly scale. If you look at Joe Biden's $360 billion Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, that is just over 10 times the amount of money that Labour promised to invest in the Green Revolution. And of course, the Labour investment has already been postponed for at least two years. And in context, the European similar investment programme is eight times larger than what Labour proposes. We are a relatively small economy in a world dominated by much bigger ones and much bigger trading blocks post-Brexit. So it's going to be very, very hard to persuade companies to come here and invest money in the long term when they look at the, the, the tax breaks and the help available in the United States or increasingly in the European Union, a problem of scale. And of course, the Americans have other really big advantages. Because of the the fracking revolution, the shale gas revolution, they have much less energy problems than we do and the Europeans do. And because of the scale of their internal market and their history, they have much deeper wells of finance to call upon when they're starting new companies. So uh, opposing all of that, rolling that stone uphill is going to be really, really hard for the Labour Party. But sticking with the domestic challenges ahead... Uh, It seems to me that if we don't grow very fast, and it's going to be really hard to, then we're going to see a lot more political turbulence ahead. We don't quite know what form it's going to take. But if you look back in history, if you look back at previous periods of British economic failure, if you look at the interwar period, that really destroyed the entire structure of old liberal England in particular and brought a kind of new politics. Uh, It involved fascism, it involved communism, and then it was closed off by the Second World War, but it was a very turbulent time. If you look at the period of the 1970s when we had stagflation and huge problems of industrial uh, strife, that brought the radical anti-status program of Thatcherism and the deindustrialization of England that we are still living through. If you look at the banking crash, the financial crash of 2008, 
That brought austerity. And again, we're still living through the consequences of that. That brought very turbulent politics. It brought Corbynism and it brought Brexit. So those were really big shocks. Now, if you look ahead at the next 10 years and you assume that we're not going to be able to turn around the period of economic failure at least quickly, then you must ask yourself, why would we not be suffering from further big political shocks? Those seem to me to be very likely. Now, in the context of that, there are some things that a British government is going to have to look at and look at very hard, and it's going to be politically difficult. One was discussed by Harry Lambert in The New Statesman last week, which is the question of shifting the tax burden towards wealth taxes and way for taxes from income. I think he made a very, very powerful case in the context of quantitative easing by the Bank of England and the huge asset surge that came on the back of that for saying that actually things have changed, that people with assets, and in particular older voters, people sitting on property, have made so much money compared to struggling younger people on low incomes that it is absolutely essential to start to shift the burden away from taxing income, particularly lower and middle income, and starting to look towards taxing wealth. But that will be an enormous problem for any government. There are, what, about 60 uh, marginal constituencies around London and the South who would be very, very heavily hit by some kind of wealth tax. So it's not an easy choice at all. And I'm sure Rachel Reeves doesn't really want to even think about it. I think she's going to have to. And then the second issue, I didn't read very much politics over the summer, but I did read a very good book by Peter Foster, who's the public policy editor of the Financial Times, about what went wrong with Brexit and how we can fix it. And he makes a very, very powerful, granular description of the way that small and medium-sized enterprises, so-called SMEs, are struggling to export to the EU and are deciding increasingly not to. There is a small but very visible and growing crisis in exporting British industry. And it's not just the, the manufacturing companies or the food producers or the farmers or the fishermen. It is also, of course, the service providers, the engineers, the accountants, and all those kind of people. There is a contraction going on the whole time, which is incredibly damaging for Britain and is going to have to be reversed. My conclusion is that we cannot go back through another Brexit referendum and try to enter the EU, even if they'd have us, which they probably now would not but that we have to start to open up much freer trading. Um, the Labour Party in the past has talked about a series of kind of dynamic sectoral deals. So you agree with the EU that you are going to uh, follow or map their regulation changes on um, some form of chemicals or whatever, and you get freer trade in result. And you have lots of those sectoral deals. And over time, it starts to feel a little bit as if we have gone back into the single market without saying so. Now, that means, and this is the hard conclusion that I come to, that we are going to have to become a country of rule takers when it comes to trade. Um, I think this is very unfortunate. Obviously, it would be much better to be inside the EU and have a vote and have a say, but that's not on offer. So we are going to be rule takers. And in my view, it's only a matter of time as to how long the penny drops about that. And these are big, hard choices, which will cause an enormous amount of argument and, and, and debate inside the country. So now, if you think the domestic side looks tough, think again about the, the foreign affairs area, because all through the summer, the thing that I have been chewing over is the remorseless progress of Donald Trump towards a second presidential term in the US. I just don't see who's going to stop him. He might be President Biden, but it looks very unlikely at the moment. He is going through these really tough prosecutions, very, very serious offences, but he is kind of wading through them like Godzilla. And I don't see anybody at the moment inside the Republican Party who's going to stop him. And those people who might stop him have got even more extreme policies than he has. And so I think in the West, we have to adopt the brace position and at least assume the possibility, even the probability, of America tearing itself in two over a second Trump presidency. And whatever you think about the Americans, and I'm not particularly pro-American, but they have always been the kind of security backstop for the West. And I think that period might be about to end. It'll have huge consequences for us. It'll have huge consequences, first of all, for Ukraine. In Kiev right now, they are terrified about the prospect of a Trump presidency. Um, and they're doing everything they can to make their case to the American people while they still think they're going to get a hearing. But if Trump becomes president, we must assume that he will try to end the war in Ukraine and end it on essentially Russian terms. 
that will have devastating consequences for European security, including our security. A revived Putin-esque Russia feeling uh, emboldened and wanting to go further and do more. We must at least consider that possibility. Then there is a totally different era. We've talked endlessly, including in the New Statesman, about the rise of AI, artificial intelligence, without really spelling out why that might be politically turbulent. But there's a very, very interesting article by a Princeton professor called Ed Felton, in which he listed all the uh, big uh, professions that are likely to be taken out early on by AI. And they are a roll call of the well-paid, quite influential white-collar professions, not just journalists, but journalists certainly, professors, academics, teachers, lawyers, accountants, people working in the financial services industry, and he goes on and on and on. And although we've talked about AI a lot, the, the, the impact on those jobs is going to be one of the big stories of the next 10 years. And I think this is really significant politically, because if you think of the times when entire societies have been upended, revolutionary moments, whether it's Paris in 1789, or whether it was the, the fascist revolutions in Germany and Italy in the 20th century, or whether it's been the various Marxist revolts before and after those. In each case, it hasn't really been the industrial workers and the peasants who have caused the revolutions and upended the societies. It's been the disaffected lawyers, the once elites who are no longer elite and are furious about it. These revolts have come from what we would now call white-collar workers. So if white-collar workers are going to have a really, really hard time, and if, as we know, industrial workers and their problems uh, as, as industry has moved to China and Vietnam and India and other places have had a really hard time, and their political revolt has had reverberations over the last 10 years, including Trumpism, uh, a lot of those populist revolts are about industrial workers and their families who did have a relatively tolerable and secure living, suddenly finding that they don't any longer. Now, if that was the case for them, think about the case for the middle classes going through exactly the same thing. I don't want to be sort of too shroud-waving, but it seems to me there is another very, very big source of turbulence. So there's all the bad news. Now, that suggests one thing above all to me, that for security, even possibly for our democratic survival, what we desperately need next is a really strong flexible government, which is a big enough majority to take hard decisions, to face down lobbies, to ignore press criticism, and to get on and take the big choices that we are going to need to protect ourselves in the world ahead. We have a kind of slightly tepid, slightly middle of the road, slightly centrist, perhaps even slightly smug political atmosphere at the moment. The general feeling, which I've shared, that we, are, we have the grown-ups again in charge of the Conservative Party, and if they lose, they're going to hand over to the grown-ups in charge of the Labour Party. And by and large, we're going to return to business as usual. After this summer, I no longer think that. I think that we are heading for a very turbulent period, and it's going to require a very strong government uh, after the next election. Now, that means I don't think there's going to be a huge Conservative majority under any circumstances. So it pro we're probably talking about the Labour Party. What I fear is a Labour government a very, very small majority or no majority at all, um, having to dodge and weave and listen to the lobbies. I think we need a strong, decisive election result with a strong and decisive government coming out of it, a government that is prepared to take tough decisions, that is not always looking over its shoulder at commentators or the media or lobby groups or anybody else, and that is prepared to take us through some hard decisions that we need, not just to prosper in the future, but frankly, to survive. If you'd like to stay up to date and you'd like to see the latest explainers, field reports, feature stories and special discussion episodes, then please, folks, subscribe to our channel today. Brought to you by Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. Experienced wealth managers who go above and beyond to guide and support you. Can Do is more than just an attitude. Can Do is navigating today for a brighter tomorrow.